putting this together. You have my heartfelt gratitude. This is just amazing. I was just reflecting this morning uh, that it is uh, just an amazing thing what God has done here. Uh, we had this at, at a place here in Scottsdale and look at where it's gone now. And, and uh, so it's just, it's just a miracle. It is the 2nd of January, 2021. Can you believe that, that it's already 2021, my Lord. And very, very glad to be here. We are in the chapter called How It Works. And in the chapter, How It Works, we are going to crack open the fear and sex inventories this morning. But before we do, we're going to open up on page 68. But before we get to page 68, let's take a look back at where we've been in the chapter. And that is what we usually do at the very beginning of, of our gatherings here, is we kind of take a look back for those who are new. And in the chapter, How It Works, Bill was was already saying he was very happy with the doctor's opinion and Bill's story and chapter two, there is a solution, more about alcoholism and all those chapters are about step one. And step two is chapter four, we agnostics. And he knew that at this point, he needed to codify the program of action that would be uh, prescribed to the alcoholic so that the alcoholic could have a spiritual awakening as a result of the step and achieve some sort of neutrality when it came to alcohol. And so in order to do that, there was going to have to be a program of action. He did not set out to write 12 steps. He just set out to close some of the loopholes in the six step program that they had been working. And when he got done, he said that the pencil almost had a life of its own. And it took, uh, it just took his hand with it. And within about 20 minutes, he wrote chapter five. Now they forced a bunch of changes on him. And there was quite a controversy because they had had a six step program. Now they had a 12 step program. So there was quite a bit of controversy around that. And uh, when the fighting was done, we have what we have today in chapter five. But let's, let's just kind of take a look at what is going on here. We are looking at the fear inventory. We've already looked at the resentment inventory. And in the resentment inventory, we inventory those resentments. What is a resentment? A resentment is something that we re-feel. Re always means to do again. Repaint, rewrite, review means to do again. And sentiment comes from an old, old word, sentiri, which means to feel. So when we have a resentment, that means we are re-feeling old hurts, old injuries, and this is where these resentments come from. And we talked last week about the fact that when we record, say, a television program, many of us have uh, recording abilities on our TV now, and we record a TV program or a movie or whatever it is, and we play that thing a gazillion times, it will be the same thing every time. When I replay a resentment, I do not have fidelity. What is fidelity? Fidelity is honesty and consistency. Uh, I'm 66 years old. So when we would buy records, say a record came out, most of the kids today don't even know what a record is, but just for the sake of us uh, older people, a record is you know for music or whatever you want we would have a choice. Did we want to spend a little more money to get the stereo or did we want to get the high fidelity? Fidelity means consistency. It will sound the same every time. But when I replay that resentment in my head, it's not that way. I change it just a little bit every single time that I replay that resentment in my head. And I make your part a little bit more dastardly, a little bit more nefarious, evil. 
and I make my part just a little bit more innocent until I was standing there doing nothing and you came along and you did me dirt and I was just as innocent as the driven snow. And when we looked at the columns of our resentment inventory, we see that the first column is who or what do you resent? It's not always going to be a who, it could be a what. I had a resentment against the expression, blood is thicker than water. Because every time somebody said, blood is thicker than water, it left me out. I don't have aunts, uncles, brothers, cousins, sisters, parents. I don't have nieces and nephews, and I don't have any of that stuff. So I don't have blood relatives, so that when people would say that, it always left me hanging. Or they would say things like, don't forget, young man, there's a lid for every pot. And there I am single for years and years and years and years wondering, well, if am I the pot or the lid? I'm not quite sure. But if I'm the pot or I'm the lid, where's my pot? Where's my lid? I wasn't quite sure how that worked. So I resented that expression at well. But you get the picture. You get the picture. And so in the first column, it's who or what do you resent? In the second column, it's what did they do to you to make you resent that 19 words or less, please don't write a book about why your sister-in-law is a witch, 19 words or less. And where do I get the 19 words or less from? I get it from the examples that Bill gives us on page 65. He gives us these examples and the cause is the second column. He never uses more than 19 words to describe the injury. Third column is the basic instinct or instincts that are involved. And those basic instincts is where fear comes from, where resentment comes from, where all of our injuries come from is either a threat to what we have now in these basic instincts or our ambitions for the future in these areas. And what are those basic instincts? Let's review them quickly because this is vital information to our fourth step inventory and to our greater understanding of what makes us tick as human beings. Remember that this is a fact-finding and fact-facing mission that we're on in step four. Very simple step, and we're going to break it down so that you never have to be afraid of it. You never have to be intimidated by it ever again. So let's break it down. The three basic instincts of life are the social instinct. In other words, I have an instinct that is imbued by, into me by God. It is infused into my soul by God to be accepted by the society around me. I don't want to behave in such a way, if I'm normal, I don't want to behave in such a way so as to cause society to um, chastise me, to cast me out, my group of friends. I want to I want to keep my friends that I have. Now, I also may have some ambitions for the future in this area. So in other words, I really like my friends. They're really nice people. But I'm kind of thinking I like this other group of friends over here. And I may want to sort of drift over and be friends with them. And if anybody thwarts my ambition for the future in this area, I'm going to resent them. I'm going to fear it. I'm going to strike out at them. I'm going to gossip about them. I'm going to character assassinate them because they're rejecting me from my ambitions in this area. They, in turn, are going to create pain and suffering for me. And when they do so, it is going to create in me a resentment. And this is where it comes from. So the social instinct. Now, even cavemen had this instinct. Even Cro-Magnum man, Peking man, Heidelberg man. These are ancient cavemen cultures. They realize, and archaeological diggings prove this out all the time, they understood that they would be safer better fed and better cared for by living in groups than they would as individual entities. So the social instinct is very strong. If you want to see a beautiful example of it, wait till the corona 
thing is over, go to any junior high school or high school at lunchtime. Here's this group, here's that group, here's this group, here's that group. And when I would pick up my daughter from junior high school, she and her partner in crime would get in the back seat of my car and they would be blithering on and on about uh, who like likes who and who likes who and who like likes who, this is more sex, but this you get the picture. Who's going to the sleepover and what sleepover are you going to? And who's invited to that sleepover? Because you know you don't wanna go to the sleepover if the wrong people are invited to that sleepover. And I, I, I toyed with the idea of throwing myself out of the car, hopefully to be run over by a truck or a bus and end this misery. Thank God it was a short trip to get uh, one of them home and then to take my daughter home was only about a 10 minute ordeal. But man, I used to get an earful of who's, who's with who and who's talking to who. Oh, and what was somebody wearing? And oh my God, and on and on and on. And they couldn't just go to the mall, right? Little kids that age, they go to the mall all the time. And if you know anything about Scottsdale, Arizona, it's Mall City. They should change the name of it to Mall Town or Mall City. We've got Fashion Square and this and that. We've got all of them. Well, you can't just go to the mall. You have to know what you're wearing and what this one's wearing. And you have to know who's going and who you're going to meet up with. You don't want to meet up with the wrong crowd. You don't want to meet up with the wrong people because that would not be okay. So I would listen to this and I would just say to myself, my God in heaven, I can't, I can't imagine. But anyway, this is the social instinct at work. The third column is the basic instinct or instinct. So the second or the or the another part of that social instinct is self-esteem. How do I feel about myself? And I've had a huge rise in self-esteem through service and self-sacrifice for other people in this program. And when I serve other people, it really helps me to feel better about who I am as a human being. It really, really does help quite a bit. So it's self-esteem is the subcategory, uh, social instinct. Then we go over to security, the security instinct, pocketbook, money, and anything that affects what I have in this money area is going to uh, is going to evolve is going to evoke this kind of reaction within me or my ambitions for the future in this money area. So security is very very important. Now under the security instinct, also we have um, emotional security. Anything that is going to upset my emotional security is going to upset me greatly and it is going to create pain and suffering for me and it's going to be something where I'm going to lash out at you, you're going to lash back out at me. Now the third area of the security instinct is personal security. In other words, if we were not on Zoom, but we were in a room, the 153 of us that are here now, if we were in a room and someone came in and we perceived them as threatening to our safety, we would react by either fight or flight. We would fight or flight from this danger. That's part of that security instinct. And that's very, very important. And that's hardwired into us by God Almighty or whatever you believe in as a power greater than yourself. Nature, evolution, creation. It doesn't matter what you believe. It is hardwired into us. And you can easily see that as well. Now, the third instinct is the sex instinct. The sex instinct doesn't have subcategories. I want to go out with this girl or this boy or this what this person, whatever, whoever they are. And I now I'm in a relationship with this person, call them person X, whatever it is. And I don't want them to leave me necessarily. But if they do, it's going to create pain and suffering for me. Or I may be 
either sans a relationship where I'm without a relationship or I'm in a relationship, but I see somebody over there I'm more interested in and I'm sort of thinking I'd really like to be in a relationship with them and anything or anyone that interrupts that is going to interrupt my ambitions for the future in that area. So we have three basic instincts of life. We have the social, the security, and the sex. And this is where our resentments and our fears come from, our threats, either fancied or real, to these basic instincts of life. If everyone on earth could have all of their instincts satisfied, there would be no conflict on earth and there'd be no reason for resentment or war or anything. But that's just not the way it works in the world that we were born into. <sighs> so the fourth column of the resentment inventory is what's my part in those resentments? What did I do to set the ball in motion? And what character defects were brought to the surface? So let's review very quickly the four columns of the resentment inventory, and they are going to mirror the four columns that we're going to be discussing in the fear inventory. The four columns of the resentment inventory are as follows. Column one, who or what do you resent? Column two, what did they do to you? 19 words or less, please. Column three, what basic instinct or instincts are involved? Column four, what did you do to bring that about? And what character defects were brought to the surface? Now, I hear good, I may, I see good now because I've had cataract surgery and corrective surgery. If you notice, I'm not wearing glasses anymore, which is great, but I hear good too. And I hear some of you saying, I have a resentment or maybe two of them where I had nothing to do with it. Maybe because there's 155 of us here this morning, some of you by statistics have been raped or molested or abandoned or physically abused by people who were supposed to love you and take care of you. Some of you didn't have this, but some of you did. And maybe you have a resentment about that that you had nothing to do with. Maybe you were three years old, four years old, five years old, whatever it is you were. You have nothing to do with that, but you're gonna have a decision to make. Is this the hill you're gonna die on? Now you had no part in that resentment. You can put DNA does not apply, but is this the hill you wanna die on? Because that resentment, whether it is justified or not, fancied or real, has the power to kill you. And how does a resentment kill you? It kills you because you will look to food to bring you relief from the untenable pain of not eating. And you will look to food as a solution. And food becoming the solution that you're most comfortable with will go in your mouth. And when it does, for about nine seconds, you will feel the beautiful relief of the emotional reduction, and you will feel fantastic. And Dr. Silkworth calls this feeling the effect. And that effect is so elusive that you will pursue it to the gates of insanity or death. And many, many people, some on this line and some of the ones that you know from your past, ate themselves to death. My own mother ate herself to death. My good friend Sherry B ate herself to death. And, and I was headed in that direction too. Some of you have stood at the gravesides of people who were alcoholics or drug addicts, and they just could not or would not see our way of life. 
and they are no longer with us and you miss them because they were searching for that effect, that sense of ease and comfort that came to them instantly by imbibing in that substance that gave them sweet relief. And the only other thing I have to suggest is a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. So we see in review where fear comes from, a threat, somebody's going to take away what I have, or somebody is thwarting in my mind, they are thwarting my ambitions for the future in these areas. And I don't want them to. And this is where fear comes from. And this is where resentment comes from. You're going to take away something I already have, or you're not going to give me what I want in the future. Okay, let's go to page 68. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. Column one, who or what do you fear? Normally fears will include people that you've harmed that you're ashamed of seeing. Maybe you owe them money. Maybe you screwed them over. Maybe you said something that hurt their feelings. Maybe you found out that they found out that you were gossiping about them. Or maybe they are what I called my policeman. In other words, I've gained X amount of pounds since I've seen this person. And this is a person that is going to be very vocal and very abusive in their language toward me about the weight that I've gained. I fear seeing these people. Most of us fear death. We may fear the death of other loved ones, children, parents, relatives, friends, whatever that may be. We have some fears connected with illnesses and death. That's very, very common. Put them down. Column one, who or what do you fear? <clears throat> Even though we had no resentment in connection with them. If you have a resentment in connection with it, then it goes in your resentment inventory. It goes in your resentment inventory. We asked ourselves why we had them. Column two, why do you fear this thing or person or institution? 19 words or less, please. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Column three in the fear inventory. This is going to mirror exactly the resentment inventory. What instinct or instincts are involved? In review, the first three columns of the fear inventory are who or what do you fear? Column two, why do you fear it? Column three, what instinct or instincts were involved. Column four in the fear inventory is what did you do to bring this fear about? And what character defects were brought to the surface? Column one, who or what do you fear? Column two, why do you fear it? 19 words or less, please. Column three, what instinct or instincts are involved? Column four, what did you do to bring the fear about, if anything, and what character defects were brought to the surface? I'm going to give just a, an example or two. I fear death. I think that's pretty universal. Some people say they don't. They may be different than me. I don't want to die. I'm finally alive. I don't want to close it up now. I want to live until I die, but I don't want to die. Okay, what did I do to bring that about? I'm going to die no matter what I'm going to do, but I'm not, I don't have to compulsively overeat. I can exercise. If I'm doing those things, that's fantastic. I sometimes feel some guilt and shame and remorse that for a long time I didn't do those things, but all I have is today. All I have is today and I'm doing those things. So I don't wanna die. 
Second column, I like living. I don't want to miss out on anything. If the Cubs win the damn World Series after I'm dead, then I'm really going to be mad. And I know eventually they're going to win one again. Uh, column three, what basic instinct or instincts are at life? Well, that would affect all the basic instincts. It would affect my social instinct. If I'm dead, I can't hang around with my friends. If I'm dead, I can't make any money. If I'm dead, I can't have any sex. So it's going to affect all the basic instincts of life. And what did I do, fourth column, to bring it about? Well, in this case, I'm not really doing anything. It's just an inevitability. It's an inevitability. I'm eating right. I'm drinking lots of water. I walk three miles a day, six days a week. I walk in the pool five days a week. I'm doing the best that I can. I eat a balanced diet. I take my medicine. I'm doing the best I can. I'm a good boy at this point in life. Not always, but I'm a good boy now. And I'm ready to move to the next fear. Don't over obsess about any resentments. Don't over obsess about any fears. Some people want to make every resentment and every fear an epic thing. It's really not. It's just an inventory. Red umbrella. Put it down like you owned a store. Fear of death, fear of whatever. I have a fear of seeing so-and-so. Why? Because I owe so-and-so money and I never paid them. I wrote them a bad check. I lied right to their face and I'm going to see them at this party and I really don't want to. I'm scared. Okay. What instincts are involved? The social instinct for sure. Emotional security for sure. Self-esteem for sure. Okay, those are all going to be affected. What part did I play and what defects were brought to the surface? The part I played was I wrote them a hot check and I never made it good. So that's dishonesty, selfishness. They're not sticking to my script. My script would be they would eat the bad check and never mention it again as long as they lived. But they're not going to do that. Okay, so I've got some dishonesty. I've got some, uh, uh, what do you call it, selfishness. And uh, you know, so those are the defects of character, selfishness and dishonesty. Resentment wouldn't play a part in here. And uh, uh, fear, of course, it's a fear inventory. So that's assumed. And self-seeking, yeah, self-seeking maybe, but you can see that's a gray area there. But I've got selfishness and I've got dishonesty for sure. Don't worry about doing it perfectly. Just do it. It doesn't say fearless, thorough, and perfect. It says fearless and thorough. It doesn't say perfect. Get it down on paper. Once it's down on paper, then we can deal with it. Okay, perhaps there's a better way. Second column of 60, second paragraph of 68. We think so, for we are now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God we trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? I think just as corrosive to my life as resentment was and is, although now I have mechanisms to deal with step 10, Fear ruled me and dominated me. It kept me at bay from what I wanted. When young elephants are being trained for the circus or for service positions, they tie the young elephant to a banyan tree. And a banyan tree is a very flexible tree with extremely deep roots. And when a young elephant, a baby elephant is chained to the banyan tree, it cannot pull the banyan tree out of its roots. And so it becomes accustomed to the fact that when it is shackled, that it is not to pull because pulling would be fruitless. I have been shackled to that banyan tree my entire life. I feared everything. I feared everyone. I was terrorized by this disease. 
I was terrorized by the illnesses to my mother and father that I have been dealing with since I was four years old. My mother was taken by ambulance to a hospital when I was four years old and my mother was deathly ill physically and my mother was deathly ill mentally. My mother was not diagnosed, she was untreated, but my mother had three distinct personalities screaming, raving lunatic, two-year-old, three-year-old, and a pretty together person. You never knew what you were going to get or how long it was going to go. We lived with a lot of poverty in my, in my family. If it wasn't for my dad's social security, we'd have lived under a bridge. He was, he was an immigrant, but he was not a person that really understood how to make a living. He just didn't get it. And that's okay. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't resent him for that any longer at all. I love him. But he was an immigrant and he was sick and he was old. And I had been dealing with old sick parents my entire life. And so I was terrorized. I never knew one day to the next what was going to happen. I just recently had my cataracts out. When my dad in 1965 had his cataracts out in Chicago, he was in Michael Reese Hospital 21 days and his head was held immobile by sandbags. I was in and out of that place in a matter of hours. The entire process of removing my cataracts, I think is 15 minutes. The, the other time is spent filling out forms and then they have to knock you out and then they have to wake you up. So they, you know, it's kind of bringing you down, bringing you up and then throwing you into the parking lot so you'll get out of there and let the next person come through. But the bottom line is, is that I had been dealing with a lot of that my whole life. And I always felt apart from the world that I was born into. Very different because I was fat. We were fat. My mother and father were compulsive overeaters. I was a, am, a, am a compulsive overeater. So we all, I always felt different. I always felt like they were into something. They had houses. We lived in an apartment. They had backyards. I didn't. They had brothers and sisters. I didn't. So you get the picture. I felt alone, even though my friends loved me, I could not feel that love for a very long time. And to this day, I struggle with accepting love. I can give love a lot easier than I can be loved. And for many people like me that are injured, that are, that are not whole, not complete, but I'm working on it the best I can, it is difficult for me to accept love, to be loved. That's the difficult part for, for me. And so these are things that I work on constantly, but in my youth created an enormous, incredible amount of fear within me. And I just never felt that I was good enough because the world around me reinforced that if you're fat, you're really not good. You're really not okay. You are completely unacceptable if you are fat. So we can laugh at those. I'm back on page 68 who thinks spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. And I found no greater strength than for me to admit that I'm weak. I'm human. I'm finite. I'm limited. But God is powerful, perfect personal, powerful beyond measure. And I am here today because of a loving God in spite of myself, in spite of my failings, in spite of the mistakes that I have made, in spite of the humanity that I'm afflicted with mortally and permanently, I am here today to say I serve as best I can. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. I'm on page 68. All men, toward the bottom, all men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. I don't apologize to anyone that I believe in a power greater than myself. And let me take a second to review here. You don't have to have the Jewish God or the Catholic God or the Protestant God or the Buddhist God. You don't have to have the Muslim God or the whatever God. 
It doesn't have to be a God of an organized religion. It doesn't have to be a God that was forced upon you. It doesn't have to be the God of your forefathers. It can be one of your choosing. And we went over that a lot in chapter four. If you want to review choosing your own higher power or coming to that conclusion that you need to look at this, look at the podcasts on chapter four and uh, Maria or Nancy or Lauren or any of the people here, Betty, I think, Pam, Sue, they can direct you to that after we're done today. But there's a lot of people out there that are attached to a God that they really don't believe in, that they really don't think is benevolent to them. And that can be dangerous too. I have to have a God for me, for me, that, I, that is on my, that not as on my side, but that looks out for me, that is there. It's a God of my understanding. It doesn't have to be something you're not comfortable with. If you are an atheist, then all you need to do is believe or be willing to believe that there's a power greater than you. It could be nature, it could be Lake Michigan, it could be whatever, it could be anything you want as long as it's a power greater than yourself. I say this all the time, there's two things I need to know about God. There is one and it's not me. There is one and it's not me. If you are an agnostic, what is an agnostic? An agnostic is someone, they're not quite sure that, that they maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God. Ag means without, Gnostic means knowledge. It doesn't matter. Or you're a firm believer. It doesn't matter. All that's required is that I either believe or am I willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself. That's all that's necessary. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. In other words, you are that instrument. You are that example. You are that message. You are the message. You are the message of what? You are the message of what God can do. If you are in recovery, you're spreading the recovery. If you're in the disease, you're spreading the disease. It's that simple. And yet it's that tough. So you are a living example of what God can do. And if you are in recovery, you are looked upon by people who can now say to themselves, I now have a reason to believe that there is a power greater than myself. I knew Joe, Larry, Larry, Curly, Mo, whoever. I knew them when they were X amount of pounds or they were anorexic or their life was circling the drain. Look at them now. This is what God has done. Every one of us that's in recovery is that outstretched hand to be the outstretched hand of Overeaters Anonymous to those who urgently seek it for this I am responsible. You may be the only copy of the big book that someone will ever read. You may be that example that they need to see. You have been uniquely selected by God to reach people that I can't reach, that most of the people here cannot reach, but there is something unique about your story. There is something unique about the way you deliver the message that is going to reach somebody who is still sick and suffering. God has a job for each and every one of us. And in order for the message to be caring, it must have depth and weight. It, frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. You could listen to all the people that tell you you need to do something about your weight. You can listen to all the talk shows, all the infomercials, but a person that can identify one to the other, that's when the message will get heard. What did Bill bring Bob, the guys behind my head, Bill and Bob? What did Bill bring Bob? Did he bring him any information that was vital? Yeah, Bob, even being a physician, had no idea about the allergy and no idea about the twist of the mind. He just knew he liked to drink. Bill gave him information on the allergy. Bill gave him information on the twist of the mind. But what did Bill give him? <clears throat> 
He gave him identification, one to the other. And we can instantly make that connection to another compulsive overeater when they say, yes, I eat like that. Yes, that's me, as Bill Dotson did. Yes, that's me, I eat like that. Yes, I've done that too. Because most of the other people in their environment cannot identify with them and they can't identify either way, but you can identify. And as the person who's doing the identifying, you will reach them, very important. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be at once we commence to outgrow fear. I feel that spirit in me. Yes, I do feel fear from time to time. Yes, I do feel anger from time to time. Yes, I still want things I can't have from time to time, but that's why I have step 10. That's why I have a phone to do service or Zoom to do service. Yes, those things will still affect me. I'm human. And no matter how evolved my recovery gets, I will never rise above the level of a human being. And as a human being, I need God's help because those feelings will drive me into the food in search of a solution to the buildup of those human emotions. Column one in the fear inventory, who or what do I fear? Column two, why do you fear it? 19 words or less. Column three, what basic instinct or instincts are involved? Column four, what did you do to bring that about? Or what did I do to bring that about? And what character defects were brought to the surface? Very simple, very straightforward. There's nothing there that should be a mystery to you or I. My confusion is equal to what my ego does not want me to see. And as long as I am mystified by this, that is the action of ego. If you have a specific question as to how to do it, it should be pretty straightforward at this point, but that's what your sponsor is for. That's what a sponsor does. They answer questions and they hold the light up to they hold the light up to the big book to show us how they work through the step. You don't need any concordances, downloads. You don't need any of that stuff. If that stuff is easier for you, do it. I don't use it because I try to keep things simple and I try to keep things as these guys behind me did them. But if you feel that those forms and there's a plethora of forms out there and books and concord, it's like a whole cottage industry. Just get it done. It shouldn't take more than about two, three hours. And it really is a very, very simple process. There's not one thing on there you don't know the answer to. Stop trying to do it perfectly. Just do it and get it done. Now let's talk about the third section of the inventory, which is the sex inventory. Now I'm going to give you what I believe. And it doesn't necessarily... I'm not, it doesn't necessarily have to jive with what somebody else believes. I'm just here, I'm just telling you what I believe. I believe that God gave us this sex instinct so that we could, I didn't say would, I said could reproduce ourselves. And he made it an enjoyable process, I'm told. He made it an enjoyable process so that we would pursue it and do so. If it wasn't enjoyable, most of us would not pursue the relationships. We would not pursue this. And so the human race as we know it would wither and die and not be here in about a hundred years. If people ceased to have sex in about 100 years, there wouldn't be anybody left on the face, 120, 100, whatever it is, there wouldn't be a human being on the face of this earth and humanity would cease to exist. So. If my sex is with somebody who is enjoying it or and or to recreate ourselves, then it's perfectly okay. As long as, and I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about you or anybody else, I'm talking about me. As long as it's with somebody who has the ability to say yes 
and the ability to say no. I don't care whether it's heterosexual relations. I don't care if it's homosexual relations, lesbian relations. I don't care. That is not a point for discussion here. Not at all. It's nobody's business and it has nothing to do with the subject matter at hand. Zero to do with it. That is your business, your choice, your life, and it is not subject to our perusal. As long as the person can say yes, and as long as the person can say no. And the other thing for me, again, I'm just speaking for me. I believe that I cannot be successfully, <clears throat> hold on one second. Here. I cannot be successfully working the steps while I'm breaking the 10 commandments. For me, I don't want to engage in any sexual activity with someone who is married. I just, unless they're married to me, I don't want to do that. That is not what I want to do. I cannot be working the steps while I'm breaking the commandments. Now, we all have sex instinct and is to what degree we pursue this and to what we do with it that we're going to look at here. Now, let me be extremely clear. This sexual harms section is going to look at, for a lot of people, one of the more guilt-producing, shame-producing, anger-producing, fear-producing sections of life. We injure each other in this area quite a bit. Now, you don't have to take your clothes off to harm somebody in this area. Let's give a few examples. If we are using our God-given sex powers for something other than enjoyment or and or recreation and or recreation, we are probably going to look at those things on the inventory. Now, let's just say, for example, you know for a fact one of your supervisors at work has been flirting with you and they seem to be interested in you. You have no concern for them. You have no, uh, you have no uh, attraction for them, but you cultivate this flirtatious behavior with this person because you want it to further your career. That is something that we would look at in a sex inventory. Perhaps you are using your God-given sex powers to harm another person. Let's take a look at how we would do that. Let's just say I'm, for example, I'm in a relationship with Mary. Mary and I are in a relationship and Mary breaks up with me. She just dumps me. And I know that Sally is Mary's best friend and it would hurt Mary if I seduced Sally. So I put a full on frontal attack towards seducing Sally. I'm really not interested in Sally. I'm gonna hurt Sally. I'm gonna manipulate Sally. I'm going to lie to her. I'm gonna harm her. And all I'm really doing is trying to get even with Mary. That is something to look at. Perhaps I'm using my God-given sex powers to manipulate another person by withholding affection. I like the red car. My wife likes the green car. So she cuts me off or I cut her off from attention. She, her cutting me off isn't the issue. I cut her off from attention. I don't give her any sex. I don't pay attention to her. I don't, I don't act affectionately toward her until she comes around to my way of thinking. This is using sex, even though you're withholding it, to manipulate and harm another person. And this is how we do it. Now, there are some other ways. Let's just say, for example, that you are in a committed relationship 
uh, and you are asking this person to do things they'd rather not do. They've expressed to you that they really don't want to do this, but you keep up the pressure. You keep mounting pressure on this person to do something which they've expressed to you is distasteful to them. Well, this is another form of sexual harm or they're asking you to do something for them that out of spite, you're just refusing to even try. These are some, but not all of the ways that we harm each other. Now, the classic way that we harm each other, obviously, is cheating. I'm in a committed relationship. I was married for 17 and a half years. I was with my ex-wife for 18 and a half years. We were together a year before we got married. And then she started having a sexual relationship with another gentleman while we were married. And so this was something that devastated me. It devastated my self-esteem. It devastated me in all ways you can devastate another person. It was extremely and continues to be uh, a sore spot. Although obviously with the steps, I've worked on this and this is something that I'm very, very grateful to be able to say uh, I'm more benign to it than I ever have been. But this takes a lot of work and it's not, it's not like a car wash where I'm just gonna go in once and come out. I have to, when these feelings come up, I have to work steps on these feelings. So cheating and manipulating, all these various things, using your God-given sex powers for something that it was not intended for with people that you care nothing for. Just because you had sex with somebody doesn't mean that you harmed them. You might have had a sexual encounter with somebody. They were looking for sex. You were looking for sex. The two of you got together. There's no harm there. You didn't harm the person. You don't have to put a laundry list of everybody that you've had sex with. That's not what this is for. Did you harm them in this area? That's what we're really looking for. Did you harm them? So get with your sponsor on this. Now, I want to touch on something too. I came into this program at 24 years of age, but I didn't go on my first date with a girl till I was 35 years of age. It would be 11 more years. I'm glad I didn't know that. I'd have blown my brains out, but it would be 11 more years before I would ever go on a date with a girl. And when I first came into this program, I thought, well, this part doesn't apply to me. I don't have to do this part. I'm a virgin. I've never had sex. Well, if that's where you find yourself today, where your sexual situation is extremely limited or non-existent, take a look at the relationships in your life. Are you friends with somebody, not because you like them and wanna be with them, but you're friends with them because maybe you think they can do something for you? Are you manipulative in your friend relationships? Are you lying to yourself or others because you really don't want to be friends with so-and-so, but you're just doing this out of loneliness? You're just kind of using them? You're just kind of using them and you're not really being honest about the whole situation? These are some of the things that I had to look at coming in as a virgin, coming in as somebody who had never had a sexual relationship in his life. And believe me when I tell you, at 400, 500, 600, 700 pounds, there's not a lot of people that have crushes on you. So I couldn't really manipulate people in that area. That just does, didn't happen to me that I'm aware of. It just did not happen to me. So these are some of the things we need to look at. Let's go to the bottom of 68 now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there, but above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation, that we, have, that we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. 
One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. In other words, there's people that are very puritanical. You have sex this way. You have sex with your wife or your husband. If you're not married, you don't have sex. If you had sex outside of marriage, it's wrong. We're not saying that. We're not, we're not judging that. This is not for us to judge. What we are judge, not judging, what we are looking at here is, did you use your God-given sex powers for something that hurt another person? That's all we're looking at here premarital sex or whatever sex or whatever method that, that's your business that is not for us to judge we want to stay out of this controversy we're going to run over a little bit guys so just be patient we do not want to be the arbiters of anyone's sex conduct again none of our business we all have sex problems we'd hardly be human if we didn't what can we do about them? We're going to use five columns for the sex inventory. We used four for resentment, four for fear. We're going to use five for the sex inventory. We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom did we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. Column one, who did you hurt? There will be no what's or no institutions here. It'll be a who. Who did you hurt? Column two, what did you do to them? Remember in the fear and the resentment inventories, we had the second column is why do you resent them? In other words, what did they do to you? Here it's what did you do to them? Column three, what basic instinct or instincts are involved? Column four, what defects of character caused you to hurt this person? In other words, what defects of character caused you to take the action in step one, in column one? Column one, not step one. And column five, what should you have done instead? I'm going to do that two more times. If you're writing it down or just remembering it, I'm going to do it two more times. Column one, who did you hurt? Column two, what did you do to them? 19 words or less, please. Column three, what basic instinct or instincts are involved? Column four, what defects of character caused you to hurt them? Column five, what should you have done instead? I'm going to do it one more time. Column one, who did you hurt? Column two, what did you do to them? 19 words or less, please. Column three, what instinct or instincts are involved? Column four, what defects of character within you caused you to hurt them? Column five, what should you have done instead? Now, we're going to run over because I want to do the sex ideal today. I, I don't want to leave that till next week. I want to do the sex ideal today. In this way, I'm on page 69. We tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? In other words, were you trying to get your script stuck to? Selfishness in the big book means the script. But in this particular case, we're looking at the other, not just the script, or is it all about me? Was I considering the other person? And that's a good litmus test. You want to know if you hurt the other person? Did you consider them for just a minute? Did you take a minute to consider the other person? Because if you didn't, you probably, you probably want to look at that. We ask God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised and loathed. Now, 
I just want to talk for a few minutes about my sex ideal. Now, this does not have anything to do with, I want her to look this way and I want her to have this color hair and I want her to have this. It has nothing to do with that. Zero, nothing, nada. The sexual ideal is mirrored back to me. What is it based on what I've learned and based on where I've been in life? What is it that I want to bring into my next relationship if I'm ever lucky enough to get one? But if I, what is it that I want to bring to that next relationship that will make it better than the mistakes I've made in the past? Briefly because I know we're running over time and I know that the Q&A is important, but I want to cover this ground because I think it's important not to stop and do it next week. That's my thinking. I married the first girl that came along. I went out with one girl who dumped me and she was, I'm still friends with her today. All these years later, we are good friends. I love her very much and she loves me, but we're, she's married to somebody else. I married the first girl that came along that didn't say the dreaded F word, the dreaded F word, F-R-I-E-N-D. She didn't want to just be friends. And I married her even though I knew there were glaring, glaring warning signs that I probably shouldn't. And I married her because as my friends like to say, Harlan finally caught a fish he wasn't going to throw it back. And they are 100% correct. I finally caught a fish. I wasn't going to throw it back. So we were married. And we, I was scared to death of her. Scared to death of this woman. This woman was always mad about something. There was never a time when this woman wasn't mad about something. And I shivered in the corner figuratively because I couldn't deal with that anger, but I figured this is better than nothing. I never felt comfortable with her. I never felt comfortable just to be who I am, just to relax and be who I am because there was always tension in the air. There was never enough money. There was never enough something. There, something was always wrong. There was something that was always, always wrong. Um, I let her make every decision possible thinking that this would appease her and it only made matters worse. And what we degenerated into very early on in the relationship, I didn't get the wife that I always wanted, but I got the mommy that I always wanted. I got a good mommy. She was great as a mom and she took good care of me. When I was sick, she would bring me soup. When I was sick, she would bring me Tylenol and she would rub my head and blah, blah, blah. We had almost no physical relationship at all whatsoever. Our sexual relationship was non-existent. We tried to have a baby. And when the first time we tried to have a baby, she got pregnant. After that, there was nothing going on in that area. I mean, nothing. The only time we touched one another is if we bumped into each other in the hallway. Well, <sighs> I finally learned after it was too late that here's my sexual ideal. The very first thing I want to bring into another relationship, if I'm lucky enough to get one, is I want to bring a recovered adult, not a child, not a scared kid, but a recovered adult, not somebody who's looking for a mommy not somebody who's looking for a caretaker, but somebody who relies upon God rather than another person. Here's another thing that I've learned in my things. There's got to be a certain amount of physical activity, a certain amount of adult swim. I'm not saying it has to be the last days of Caligula. I'm not saying it has to be like a porno set. I'm not saying that. I'm 66 years old. I assume the person's going to be 50s, 60s, whatever it is. It's not going to be like that. But there has to be a certain amount of physical contact within the relationship. And what I had before was a completely platonic marriage. That's not going to work for me. And that's not going to work for me. 
I've learned that I have to be in recovery. I have to be in the situation where I am continually working on the relationship with this other person just as fervently as I work on the relationship with God. And I work on that constantly. And that no matter what the age, there's going to be a certain amount of problems that are going to come up. But if I'm a recovered adult, then the marriage or the relationship has a very good opportunity to thrive. If I'm not a recovered adult, and the best way to ensure that a relationship from my experience will thrive is to be a recovered adult. Abstinence makes a house a home and the food makes a home a hell. That's just what I've seen in my life. I've not only seen it with me, I've seen it with other people as well. Abstinence makes the house a home and it is tough. It is, it's, especially at this age, it's much tougher for the guys than it is for the gals. I mean, it's tougher at every age for the men than it is for the women. Women, dating is a female's ball game and they set the pace, they make the rules and it, this is just the way it is. It's just, just life. But it's especially tough at this age. It's especially tough at this age. Um, but if I'm lucky enough to get into another one, then I'm, I'm hoping to bring that into the relationship. And here's the kicker, and then we'll go to Q&A. I have to be comfortable with the person. I have to be comfortable. I'm not talking about when we're out on a date or when we're out on the town or whatever. I'm talking about we're in the living room. I'm watching the Ducks game or I'm watching the Bears or the Cubs and she's reading a book and it's okay just to be me. It's okay for her just to be her. It's okay for me to coexist. And I don't have to be afraid. I'm never, ever going to walk on eggshells ever again. So I have to bring an adult. If I have to walk on eggshells, if I have to worry about what you're pissed off about, let's just call it good. We'll be the dreaded F word. We'll be friends. But a relationship with that person for me is impossible because I'm never, ever, ever going to do that to myself again, ever. I'm never going to walk on eggshells again. I don't care if she looks like Cleopatra. Not going to happen. If I have to walk on eggshells, I'd rather be alone. So these are some of the things that are the ideals that I have. It has nothing to do with the other person. It has to do with me. And I didn't want to leave that till next week. Okay. Now, it is now time for me to write down where we left off. And I'm going to remind you of a couple of things before we break for question and answer. Uh, first of all, if you've asked a question last week, please step back and let somebody else go. If you ask one last week, let, give somebody else a chance. And um, not ne next week we are here, the week after. That's January 16th and 17th. I'm going to be doing the OA birthday big book study. So we will not be meeting in this forum in two weeks from today, we will not be meeting in this forum. And there'll be somebody here in case somebody forgets to sort of remind you if you tune into the Zoom that we're not here. So on the OA birthday, which I recommend you signing up for, you can do that by going to the Los Angeles Overeaters Anonymous website, L-A-O-A-I-G, Los Angeles Overeaters Anonymous Intergroup. It's the largest intergroup in the world. Sign up for the birthday. It's $30. It'll be the best 30 bucks you ever spent in your life. And it'll be a wonderful, wonderful Zoom convention. Okay. The uh, link is on I don't know. Podcast. I'm assuming Maria. I'm assuming Maria is going to do this. Or Hi, Harlan. Know. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Harlan. Thanks so much. That was amazing, Harlan. And we, we're going to post a link for the LA birthday party into the great. chat function. So people will have the link there. Nancy J is going to host the Q&A. And as Harlan mentioned, please no food questions. And also, if you asked a question last week, we ask that you hold back because we've got 100, and at one stage, we had 100, over 170 people on the line. We've currently 157 people. So to give them an opportunity to ask a question. So over to you, Nancy J. 
Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you, Harlan. Another fantastic big book study is just wonderful. And, and now we're going to do questions and answers. And if you can raise your hand electronically, that's wonderful. If you can't, after we take care of these hands raised electronically, I'll then ask you just to shout out because I want to give everyone a chance to ask the questions. So first we have Beth from New York. Beth, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much for taking my question. Hi, Harlan, and thank you so much for all your service. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so yeah, hearing about this fifth column in the sex inventory was news to me. And uh, I looked at the paragraph and I, I see that I've missed the what should we have done instead. So I would like for you to expand on that a little bit if you could. Okay, let's just say for example that uh, you and I were married. You and I are a married couple. And uh, Maria over there, um, I got mad at you and I had a sexual affair with Maria. Uh, and now in the inventory process, I get to that fifth column. What should I have done instead? Instead of going out of the relationship, stepping out and becoming an adulterer, instead of stepping out of the relationship, I should have said to you, Beth, Beth, we're having a problem. Let's go to a therapist. Let's talk. Let's communicate. Let's see what we could do, sweetie. We're married. Let's work on our marriage. Instead of going out and looking for something outside the marriage, I should have stayed within the marriage and I should have worked it out with you. That's what I should have done instead. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Beth. Okay. The, and Beth, thank you. The next person is Karen. Karen, are Karen. you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much, Harlan, for everything tonight. Um, I have a question. Um, in the very beginning, uh, those who did the 12 steps, do we know how fast they did it? Uh, and Usually they did it within a couple of days. They did it very, very quickly. I take people through that are willing to do it. They're willing uh, seven days. I do a chapter a day. Uh, I give about three hours for the fourth step. The next day they do step five and we're off to the races. So I, I do this, I do the 12 steps in about seven days, but they did it. They realized early on that the faster you finish the process, the more effective it becomes. And what happens in a lot of cases today is people want to stretch it out and stretch it out and take it real slow. And that, that doesn't help anybody because what happens then is you're dieting with group support for too long. The question remains, how long can you hold your breath underwater? So for some people, not long. If they can't do, hold their breath underwater, they're going to go back into the food. They're going to go get a, a, a gasp of air. So they did it very quickly. I believe that doing it quickly is the most effective. You don't get this by absorbing spiritual information. You get it by transmitting spiritual information. So the faster we can get you sponsored, the more effective it becomes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It, is it Karen or Karen? How do we say your name correctly? Karen. Karen. Karen? Yeah. Thank you. Karen, Karen is a beautiful name. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, next, we have another name, G-H-I-S-L-A-I-N. How do you say that? Hi, everyone. I'm Ghislain. I'm a compulsive writer. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, uh, Thank Harlan. My question is the sex inventory. Does the other person need to know that I could have hurt them? For Does me the other to... piece person need to know that you could have hurt them or that you did hurt them? Oh, I hurt. yeah, both. Well, if they if you hurt them, then obviously they know about they it. They will know. They will know. Uh, if they, they may not be aware of what you could have done or should have done, they are aware more of what you did do, actually did do. Um, but when we get into the ninth step, we're going to cover this more thoroughly. And that is, if they don't know, then we're going to look at, you know, leaving them alone because sometimes that's the best course of action. But just Lane, if they, if we hurt them, then eventually we're going to have to make amends for it. And for the case, for this, whether they know or not, put it down, 
write it down. If you stepped out of your marriage, if you use your God-given sex powers to hurt another person, put it down. Put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Just Lane. Just Lane, thanks so much. Now, according to the, my phone, Peppy V is next. Peppy, can you Peppy. hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Peppy V from Greece. Uh, I wouldn't miss your this meeting for the world, Harlan. And we're looking very forward to having you in the Greece uh, uh, yes. presentation that you're having with us. Uh, I wanted to ask this. Uh, you said that for people that do not have sexual life, uh, you, they could, they should uh, go ahead and uh, uh, see if they have manipulated their friends or the, the, the friendship relationships. Uh, for those who do have uh, uh, sexual life and do have manipulated in this way, don't don't they also have to do that for their friends? Yes, they should. Yes, absolutely. In the fear, in we the look fear, in all the our relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you oh. will. If you've manipulated them, if you befriended them for some reason other than affection, other than friendship, you absolutely put it down. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. In the sex, in the sex inventory. You can you you can put it in the resentment inventory if you resent them. You can put it in the fear inventory if you fear them. If not, put it in the sex inventory. All right. Thank you it's so much. It's a relationship, much. and you step you you did something to hurt another person. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Peppy. Thank you, now, Peppy. There's, there's three names, and some have come and gone, so I'm going to ask if you're there. Catherine, are you there? No. Lori J., are you there? I am and here, then but Harlan already yeah. answered my question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Lori, thank you. And then there was someone named Redmi, R-E-D-M-I. Redmi, are you still there? Well, it looks like all the hands have been acknowledged. And so now I'm going to ask, is there anyone who just wants to give their name and ask their question without raising the hand? Hi, this is Cindy from Washington. I have a question. OK, Cindy. Yes. Hi, Harlan. Thank you so much. Um, this is my first step four. And um, I believe I'm taking too much time. Just hearing everything um, going through my resentments and stuff um, but what's that how long have you been working on it um i've taken two days probably about six hours each day you're taking way too much time get it done get it done today and let's move on okay I can't right, imagine um, what you've been writing about for 12 hours. I can't even imagine. Well, I've taken extra time for prayer, which has been really meaningful. I think Get it that's... done and then you can pray. Get it done okay. and then you can pray. Get it okay. done. Um, my question about the sex in inventory is that um, I am married. I've been married for 18 years. Um, probably about... Did you get married when um, you were two? No. No, I'm 50. <laughs> no way. Um, no, anyway, go on. <laughs> Um, at any rate, my, um, my husband and I do not have sex any longer. Um, it's been probably six years, six years. Um, I don't feel like I am uh, like we do this because I have been withholding out of anger or anything. It's just been, I have no interest, like physically have no interest, <laughs> mentally have no interest. So, um, how do I do that on my sex inventory? Is that I am harming him anyway yes. in the relationship. Yes. yes. What should you have done instead? You, you probably need to go to counseling. You probably need to sit and communicate with him. You need to do something. This is the one life you have. This is the one husband that you have. And uh, I would suggest strongly 